Our next lecturer is Professor Manish Arora. Professor Arora is the Dean of Student Welfare at the Sada Bhagwan Singh University, Dehradun, India. He is the Senior Consultant of the Office of Therapy Clinic and the Director of STEM Rehab, Dehradun, India. He is a member of the Regulating Committee of Physiotherapy of the University Grants Commission of India. Professor Arora is not only a specialist in physiotherapy but also a specialist in osteopathy with more than 22 years of teaching experience. He has conducted more than 50 extended lectures and workshops all over India and supervised more than 200 undergraduate and postgraduate dissertations. He is an external examiner at 25 universities. He had presented and published more than 130 papers in various international and national journals. Professor Arora, a specialist in manual therapy, developed new concepts like dry needling in myocardial release and rapid manual scans for muscle dysfunction. He was rewarded with six national level awards, including the Physio Ratan, Jewel of Physiotherapy, and the Best Academician Award. Without further ado, I cordially invite Professor Manish Arora to deliver his lecture on Drop Table Technique and Osteopathic Manipulation Therapy for Knee Osteoarthritis. Thank you, ma'am. I think it's a great pleasure for me to be here on this platform of Sri Lankan Physiotherapy Society. And I'm humbled by this invitation by the President, Secretary, and my dear friend, Dr. Vasanta, to be here on this platform. Let me share my screen. Please give me a second. I hope you are able to see my screen. Yes, sir. We, we were able to see. Thanks a lot. I'm going to talk about the manipulative therapy in osteoarthritis. It may be a little out of the box thinking in terms of what we physios have been doing all these years. But then everything adds to our abilities. And with this effort, to augment our abilities in treating and not only in treating but preventing osteoarthritis, my this little presentation is there. I've been already introduced by the worthy coordinator. So I'll skip these slides with the lined up. I've been trying to learn osteopathy, though my technical uh, skills started with my master's in physiotherapy, but off late, I've been trying to add up more and more into osteopathy. And why so? Because every little tool is important when you're working as a clinician or as a workman. Osteopathy definitely is another booster, but not at the expense that it is a substitute for we have been doing all these years. So it adds up to our ability as a physiotherapist to what my predecessors have talked about. And my this little effort is to mix the concepts because human body does not get divided into the domains of osteopathic physiotherapy or chiropractic. It only has our ability to work normally, which we call it as physiology. It has got its own structural ways of working, which we call it not me. And these all techniques, or these all branches of manual therapy should work together in trying to restore the function 
of the human body by correcting structural faults. The problem is we always think manipulation is just about giving a few cracks. Actually, it is not true. And it can be very dangerous if it is done without any proper diagnosis or proper evaluation. The role of manipulative therapy is not just creating those pops, because those pops are those high velocity thrusts which bring the changes in our six structures actually are at times not doing the effect they want to create. Most of the times when you manipulate a joint, it may occur at a joint which is already moving nicely, but not at an area which is hypermobile. So we want to find the exact thing and then work on it. And before I go into that domain, let me tell you, we have to understand that pain and dysfunction comes from various reasons. If I have inflammation, I would definitely like to use eyes and inflammatory controlling mechanisms rather than doing a manipulative therapy. A patient may have pain because he may be only recruiting his particular muscles because creating some tension. And this could be because he has a psychosocial issues where the tension in the muscles is creating an imbalance. So there, I may need to work differently. But if the patient comes with a biomechanical dysfunction, this kind of talk which I'm doing is going to be more suitable for those patients. We all know our joints have an ability to move in a controlled manner. Neither over-mobility in this joint, which is called as hypermobility, or lack of mobility in these joints, which is called as hypermobility, are good for the joints. And again, the hypermobility or lack of movement in the joints can come because I have a problem in the capsule of the joint where there's an articular fixations, where the drops and these mechanisms are going to work. Whereas I may have a person who is not able to perform the full rate of the joint because the myofascial elements do not work. There are techniques like myofascial release or what we have developed a very active and precisely controlled way of releasing the fascia, which we call as myopalytics works. Similarly, in an unstable joint, I will require some fixations or in a joint where there's a burnt of generalized hypermobility in the body, I may require techniques like kinetic control, pilates, or other things. We all know this chart. Hypermobility can be from no movement of ankylosis, where the joint has used, I'm not going to get any purchase out of my these techniques. Then I have a considerable decreased movement, which may be because of cross degeneration, where I may have a limited role in getting the restoration of function. But when hypermobility comes because of lack of joint play, my techniques are going to be the best useful techniques in that. Of course, hypermobility, this is not the cup of tea. Now, these kind of fixations, which we call the lack of joint play, come from two different reasons. In today's world, the biggest cause is myofascial imbalances and the second cause of this is trauma. So the joint <coughs> is used in its optimal position. The structures on both the sides stay balanced. But if I use asymmetrically, one side muscle will definitely become more powerful, pulling the joint away from its axis as compared to the other side. That is where I will have a issue with the joint losing its ability to the symmetrical. And over a period of time, maybe years together, the joint may also get misaligned in one direction and get struck in that direction. And then the problem of this lack of mobility contributes to further deterioration of the joint. So if my myofascial elements are good, the joint stays healthy, 
But if the myofascial elements are tight, what will happen? They'll pull the joint out of its alignment. Like this, the myofascial element shown by the orange arrow is now becoming tighter and it puts the joint out of its alignment, creating a friction between the articular surfaces, damaging the articular cartilage. Still worse, sometimes my core strength does not allow the joint to go out of alignment. I shouldn't be happy about it because this orange arrow again, which is now becoming tighter, representing the myofascial tightness, now is going to create a pull on the periosteum and drag that periosteum leading to osteophytes and spurs. And this is how the dysfunctions all begin. So as we know, the car tire would last longer if it is aligned with, on its wheel. Previously, osteoarthritis was said to be age-related disorders. Any time, if you drive the car for, say, about 80, 90,000 kilometers, will wear out. Any knee will start wearing out with age. But the biggest culprit is not the age. We have seen people, and you must have seen people, who are 80 years and they do not have any problem with the knees. But there are people with 40 years who have a lot of problems with the knees. So alignments are set to the bigger offenders. And that is why osteoarthritis in an X-ray is seen by its asymmetry. If both the sides in an X-ray show degeneration or reduced joint space, we rarely blame it to osteoarthritis. A bilateral reduction in space, uh, space maybe because of rheumatoid arthritis, where the pan panis encroaches this thing. But in osteoarthritis, normally it's a one side more than the other. So, why this degeneration will occur? A joint in a healthy stain breathes easy, it moves up and down the bones relative to each other, and they are not fixated. Now, such a joint has good synovial sweep so that the little damage which may occur is easily repaired because the nutrition comes from the synovial movements. But when the joint gets misaligned and it goes into the plastic zone, as said by White and Punjabi, rather than staying in its elastic zone, it gets struck. So not only the joint has a poor alignment where there's a rubbing of one area, but the lack of synovial sweep makes the joint less able to repair itself. And this is where the problem begins. So what we need is to ensure two things. Not only we restore the correct alignment of the joint, but we restore the mobility of the joint by getting it back into its position. So that is what our aim is. One important thing, which I picked up from the work of Robin McKenzie, though he talked about in his book in, for, on back pains, but is very pertinent to all the joints of the body is the self-limitation of problems. What happens when we get an initial pain, if I have a misaligned joint, it may create a little inflammation. My medicines are not even some medicines, the pain will go away in a few days on its own. That's what Robin McKenzie said about 44% of the patients with low back pain will become better in one week on their own without any intervention. 86% of them will become better in one month and 92% within two months without seeing any therapist, chiropractor, physician, and anybody. Because the body has an ability to mask its own difficult uh, dysfunctions. And that is usually done by some compensatory changes. Now let's apply this thing on the knee. If I have a reduced medial joint space, as you can see on this X-ray, my body will try to get me out of pain by overactivating the muscle on the lateral side, like the tensor fascia lateral and the iliotibial band. Now, when the tensor fascia lateral and iliotibial band which attaches on the garden tubercle on the tibia, pulls the tibia more upwards, the space on the medial side is made better. 
But what will it result in? It will only result in creating a bicompartmental osteoarthritis with passage of time with a dysfunction not longer staying just with the medial compartment, but across dysfunction of the entire joint will start occurring. And this is where a little problem which could have been resolved early now becomes more devastating and we are left with no options but to go for more aggressive methods of correcting it. And how to further understand that, many times when we have a nice carpeted grass, certain weeds grow up. And that is what happens with the initial aches or pains in the body. But when we neglect that, or we just try to cut that weed rather than removing the roots of the weed, what happens? The dysfunction inside keeps on growing like the roots, but we feel temporarily better. So the painkillers and pain inhibiting substances actually are not doing any good, rather than it is burning that fire, which is hidden from outside, and we feel good about it. So over a period of time, with poor exercise and lack of proper treatment, these weeds keep on growing and they spoil the entire area. Like this garden, the joint also goes into severe degeneration. And by the time everything is lost by our hands, all we now require is to take away all the right and the wrong grass and regrow it. And that is what we call in our terms, replacements. So the God-gifted nice joint has to be now replaced by an artificial joint, which I'm very sorry to say is not even 50% capable of doing those things which a normal joint would have done. So this is where the problem actually is keeping on growing. My objective is not just to try to treat those patients who have still some abilities left to self-help themselves, which is maybe a great one, osteoarthritis or great to osteoarthritis, but also my bigger challenge is to prevent that. One of my teachers from my medical college where I studied said osteoarthritis starts developing in 30s. In 40s, we realize that something is there inside our body. At 50s, we get in trouble and 60s, we are no longer having osteoarthritis because steel does not have osteoarthritis. It is by the time replaced by artificial joints. So that is what we want to do. So if a patient comes to you, we are not only responsible to get that little ache or pain controlled by our IFTs, ultrasounds and other things, but also we need to restore the myofascial health. We need to make the joints play restored. We need to ensure that none of the myofascial elements are right tighter. So this is what has been seen. This is a ratification of what Mackenzie did in his book. We get pain and dysfunction when some stress comes on the joints. I'll get a knee pain only if I'm doing more miles than I've been doing, or I'm suddenly climbing more stairs or squatting more. My body was capable of managing my function abilities without giving me trouble. But when I overloaded it, some triggers get formed and I get the pain. And as a result of the pain, I go to a doctor and if he just gets rid of my pain, which is wonderful, it is his job, it's the job of a therapist to reduce the pain, but if it doesn't restore the structures back to what they should have been, over a period of time, this will, with the same stress, it will grow into a bigger pain and bigger dysfunction. But if you, while treating this pain, also restore the myofascial and the articular balances, this thing is less likely to come. And that is where we need to identify and correct those structures. Our objective is not just to restore the increased pain back to normal, but also
get the joint perfectly aligned and suited so that both the function is restored and the pain is brought to normalcy. That is what the entire aim is. We need to find the directional fault because if we are not finding the directional fault, we may be wrongly correcting it. So if the bone aligns in a different direction, I have to do it in a different way. I have to use different X's, I have to use different planes to correct this kind of fault. Now, I have very many options I have. I have options which probably a good manipulative therapist or a chiropractor would do, which is a joint manipulation. I have options of Mulligan, which repeatedly I do the right direction moment and reposition the joint. I have Maitland, which again, by repeatedly pushing in the right direction will correct me. So all of them have their advantages and all of them have some disadvantages. So I want to add something more to that. Normally, if I am going to go for a manipulation, it will have a risk of maybe sometimes crossing this paraphysiological space and breaking the ligaments if I go into the anatomical barrier because these manipulations are always short lever but high velocity, low amplitude. So the amplitude is very less, but I need very high velocity. It's just, I find where, see, I find where the fixation is and then I pull it out. It's just like this braking system. I go at a very high velocity and suddenly stop. So the advantage of this manipulation is that in a very quick manner, rather than multiple repetition sessions, which are required in Maitland, I get the joint restored back to its normal position. But the danger is, if my brakes are not applied on time like this, I may have an accident. So to overcome this and to make the manipulations more safe, the drop techniques have been felt to be very, very useful. And that was what I thought that I may just put a little word about these things. These drop techniques can be easily learned, are more safer and more surer because this is what can happen with the manipulation because you're doing a high velocity thrust, you may not control it and may end up in something which you never intended to get up. So with drops and these kind of devices, which now in physiotherapy world are called as physiotherapy instrument for mobilization, we can, we can open the joint and create it better. So this is a real time uh, MRI picture, uh, dynamic MRI. If you see this dynamic MRI, uh, if you, this is, I don't have something on the knee, but I have a thing to show you on the upper cervical spine. So you could see the C2 spine, which is obviously the first large structure to palpate. And there's an atlas in between and the occiput. So if you see here in the image, you could see how the joint when fixated is moving together. The C2 and occiput are moving together. They should have moved independently. So when they were treated by the instrument adjustments. This is what you're going to get after the treatment. Now, if you see out here on the right side, you could see the joint opening and closing, but on the left side, you could see, which is done before the adjustment, they're moving together. So that definitely says that it's not a myth that adjustments do not correct the fixations, but rather they are a real time corrections of these fixations. And remember, these fixations are not on the area only where you get the trouble. For example, in osteoarthritis of the knee, these fixations could not just be on the knee itself, but they may be coming because my navicular bone may have fixated superiorly. So when my navicular bone gets fixated superiorly, my arch is going to stay high. I'm not going to get that 
cushioning of my arch, I may have a more chance of developing medial joint osteoarthritis for two reasons. One, that springing power or that safety factor which comes with my arch going up and down, which is more like a uh, piston in the car which gives you a shock prevention, is not working. And secondly, when my joint is at the foot, the metatarsal joints are going to stay supinated. I will have an increased external rotation of my tibia, and this will create a more damage to my knee joint. So before I go to the area where I need to fix it, I need to check the distal joints, maybe sometimes even the proximal areas, like not necessarily, it's just the fixations. I may have a pure autonomic control coming from the spine, or it may be because a poor neurology may be coming from an L3 fixation of the vertebra. So in osteopathy, we work holistically. We are not only confined to the area where the problem is, but we work on the areas which are all concerned with the normal movement of that. So I may have a problem in this spring, but I need to work on the structural movement spring. So that is very important. Now going to the osteoarthritis in the knee, in the medial compartment, as I said, I'll first correct the spinal subluxations, sacroiliac fixations, hip fixations, and ankle fixations, and also check the neurological connections at L3. But then I'll work finally on the knee joint itself. I think globally, but also act globally. That is the motto of osteopathy. So what kind of fixation do you have? See, our joints are not of equal size. Inherently, there is a chances of one joint, that is medial compartment, getting more overloaded than the lateral compartment. Why so? Because we wanted a knee to get locked when we stand, the sizes were unequal, and there was there's always a coupled motion in the knee of rotation, which occurs with flexion and extension. And that is why we have three kinds of common misalignments in medial compartment of osteoarthritis, which is more done with genuverum. So I'm going to have more likely laterally fixated tibia, externally fixated tibia, and posteriorly fixated tibia. If you see, this is an X-ray on the figure two of a patient who is having a medial joint osteoarthritis. You could see the tibia is tending to move laterally. It tends to go external rotated and it tends to move posteriorly because most of the time our posterior structures like the medial hamstring, the gastrocnemius, they tend to be more over working. So we tend to get these kind of things. And this is not just the belief of osteopaths, but if you have read Brian Mulligan, it says for medial knee pain, you have to glide the tibia medially. That means the tibia, in most of these degenerative osteoarthritis cases, is shifting laterally. So we need to identify first. Uh, my previous speaker, said one wonderful thing. Every individual is different. We cannot have preset protocols. We need to tailorize. So we need to find the faults and we need to correct the faults. I need to find if this external rotation of tibia is there or not. We need to verify by biomechanical marking motion joint play. I have to check if my joint is externally struck it will not easily move in the medial direction. It can be seen with the Q angle, can increase the crepitus, and I need to find it. Once I find it, I will correct it either by using Mulligan, Maitland, high velocity as seen in this image, or by these drops. 
So how these jobs are being done, you can see on this little video. Now, now if you see uh, this, if it is externally struck, I've used one little drop here. I need not to have two drops. I can only do with one of these drops. But since I'm not in my home place and I have to do it this uh, outside, I didn't have uh, appropriate size you know, in terms of thickness, a wooden piece or something which I could keep it there. So if I don't keep something below the femur, that can create a little hyper extension of the knee when I'm trying to thrust. So I need one little block of wood, maybe a couple of books to stabilize this femur. Then once I've done this, I keep this drop loaded. Now the drop is loaded by a lever, which you can see here. And the weight in the drop is adjusted by the black round knob. So I find the fall. And once I have found, I want to do it, I thrust it in this drop piece. So the general group of the drop mechanism is you have to thrust it three times. And <clears throat> since it's a webinar, if you had been would have been live, I would have showed you that with motion testing, we would have found the tibia to be externally struck. Once I have treated with the drop, it immediately shows an improvement in the motion. So this is for the externally struck tibia, which is part of the three common alignment faults which you have. The second is a posteriorly translated tibia. The tibia normally would be restricted in the translation with the ACL and PCL ligaments, but a couple of millimeters posterior and a couple of millimeters anterior could get it struck into the rear posteriorly. If it is not believed to be that, then why are we giving midline where we give a A to B glide when I have a lack of flexion? So it's a confirmed thing for flexion, we give an A to B glide because it's struck anteriorly. For extension, we give a P to A glide because it's struck in extension. So same thing we could do with either giving a manipulation like this or using these drops. So these drops, now, again, I'm using for correcting the posterior struct tibia. So you see, I'm placing the tibia on the drop and the upper side is not fixated because on the drop, I drop my hand on tibia, which is going anteriorly, only by thrusting the femur posterior. So if the femur is thrusted posteriorly, automatically it will create an anterior directional pull on the tibia. So this is how I correct it. And then, very important but not the last thing, could be a correction of a laterally struck tibia. So if tibia is struck laterally, it will still create and maintain the fault. So how will I manage this? I can give manipulation here. I can use mulligan, as I said, or I can give thrusts in various directions, or I place the position in a sideline position and try to achieve the drop. Right, so that doesn't end my work. Of course, I need to rebalance the muscles like VMO because 
If they won't fire, I won't have a stability. I need to correct the soft tissue structures, which are tighter, which may be my adductor magnus muscles fascia. It may be medial hamstring. I need to recruit the right kind of muscles. I need to reset my neural firing, which has a feed forward mechanism where the stabilizers are recruited before that. For that, I have to do the right kind of exercises. So once I realign the chopping, I balance the structures. I'm 100% sure I'm not only going to treat some of the patients with early to moderate osteoarthritis, but in many patients, we have been trying to eliminate the chances of getting osteoarthritis later. So I jokingly say to my patient, your knees cost you three lakhs and they are not even as good as the original ones. A car tire only costs you about 3,000 rupees so, or 4,000 rupees. So you go and get your car tire wheels aligned when they are even normal. But nobody comes without pain to get the knees aligned. But if we correct the alignments, we restore the myofascial elements before they develop, we can prevent a lot of osteoarthritis. And I have seen in my care for the last 22 years when we are working, we have a better outcome in terms of the normal population statistics of having less osteoarthritis developing in the patients. And those who came to us about eight to 10 years before with some early changes, they have not only improved their function, but they have not deteriorated. I don't want to put some individual patient messages, but we have recorded to a patient who could hardly walk for 50 meters and then why surgery is walking even a two to three, two to three kilometers. So the right things when done in the right way definitely are going to change the way things have been happening. We are going to not only prevent surgeries, but save a lot of dysfunction and problems in the patient. That's my belief. The magic is not in an instant care, but thinking of the long-term health. That's what Corona has taught to us. I may be a little different in my beliefs, but this is what I've been practicing and getting very good results. And that is why I wanted to share these little bits of information. I'm sorry, there was total mismanagement. I was almost sweating half an hour back because my computer had some major issues with internet surfing. So thanks to the organizers, I could be here. And thank you very much for giving a patient here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It's a really wonderful session, sir. Thank you once again, sir. Meanwhile, if you have any uh, clarifications or questions, you can type on the chat box so we can ask our sir. Uh, if you have any doubts, please use the chat box and you can ask questions.